so much. Um, I requested that song tonight. I like this song requesting. If, when you've, if you're not getting the text message that asks you to request songs, do make sure we have your mobile number because it's nice to hear from people during the week. It's lovely. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is really, um, I went to an event on Monday in, in London and there was this lady speaking and when she spoke, I, I just found her absolutely fascinating as a person to listen to. And she said some things that really got me thinking. And um, I kind of want to share them with you tonight. I'm going to share a bit of what she said. Because um, it, it, it's just, I think you'll find her take on things and her story very, very fascinating, as I did. And as I've been trying to sum up um, what I've been hearing over the last few weeks, and what it sort of, I like to know what to do with things. I like to know, um, you know, I hear something, I think, right, what do I do with that? Um, what's been coming to me loud and clear is that um, I have to be able to change my mind. And we have to be able to change our minds because it is very, very easy to get into a fixed way of thinking. Um, this lady, I'll skip ahead. You normally do this, but I'm skipping ahead. She said this. She said, we believe it because it has been believed and therefore we have to keep believing it. And I think that's so true. We get into a way of thinking that life works and so we keep believing that that's how life works because there's almost a safety in that. And I found that I'm not very good at changing my mind. Um, I quite like things to be what they are and I quite like things because it helps me feel um, secure and as we've been hearing Jesus came onto the scene sent by his father to really um, show people that he wasn't what they thought he was he was there in the business of changing minds and a God that they believed they'd seen experienced been told about were loyal to it was very real to them within the stories that they'd been given around that God um, and he came to sort of almost shake that up. And so they were looking like going, well, gods don't do that, do they? Gods don't really go that far. Gods don't become the sacrifice. They demand the sacrifice. That isn't what gods look like. So he came very much onto the scene to change um, people's minds. Now, changing your mind isn't a negative experience in itself, is it? You can ch change your mind and it can lead to something positive. Or you could change your mind and it could lead to something negative. But in itself, having a sense in which we can change our minds about things is not a negative. And I think sometimes in a church community when there's very sort of fixed doctrines, and I was raised a little Baptist girl, you know. I moved over to the other side, a little Baptist girl. And I have lots of really interesting, lovely chats with my dad about different things around doctrine. And um, these things can be so fixed because that just means the sort of rules within different ways of doing it. We're almost frightened to um, change them and mess with them because we think we're doing something wrong. But changing your mind in itself is actually part of life. Children change their minds. We don't believe what we did when we were five. When we're 50, there's a process. Um, how do you know, though, where you stand if you keep changing your mind? I have been married for 14 years. Have I? Yeah, 14 years. Um, if he kept changing his mind about whether he wanted to be married to me or not, that would be quite unsettling. He wants some things to be fixed, don't you? I want him to have made up his mind about me and then to stay for the next however many years. Um, but if you keep changing your mind about things, it's difficult to feel secure or anchored in something. And how can you trust in other people when they keep changing their mind? When they told you something once, then six months later they tell you something diff different. We find that genuinely really hard. We find it hard in all sorts of contexts, not just in church. I've worked in um, many, um, many years in a school. Um, you know, one minute we're doing this policy over here, then six months later we're doing this policy over here. And like, make your mind up. Let's do this or let's do that. Stop changing it. It's really, really difficult because we like to be able to locate ourselves, center ourselves, work out what we're doing. And everybody appreciates that. Now, we can become so loyal to former ways of doing things and former thinking that to somehow think differently it is like you're, you're losing a piece of yourself because you've identified with those things for years and years. And now all of a sudden it's like, you can't have that bit. You can't take that bit. And, and I get that. And a number of us in here get that. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about this lady I met this week. She's called Camilla. I can't tell you her last name because I can't pronounce it. But her name will come up when I show you a little clip of her. And she is a lady who, she's from Iranian. I might get some of these facts wrong, but roughly speaking, she's from um, Iran. She's Iranian. 
And she, her dream from when she was nine was to set up an orphanage for young children, which I think is a fairly incredible dream for a nine-year-old and it makes you wonder what sort of things she was seeing that, that put that in her heart. But then she had to become a refugee and she had to leave Iran. And she came over here and she started working with incredibly um, challenging young people. I mean, incredibly challenging in inner city London, all sorts of very extreme um, behaviors, all sorts of very difficult problems. Now, she herself has a special need. She can't read or write in the same way you and I can. So she can't sort of make notes and read them because she wouldn't be able to read them. And it was really interesting because she said, because of her, the way her brain's wired, she said while she was speaking the other day, no notes because she can't use notes. She said, please don't take a picture of me because the flash will make my brain react and I will literally um, stop thinking. So guess what someone did? Why? Why? Why would you? Someone thought, I know, I'll take a picture of her. So they, partway through her speaking, they, someone took a photo and I saw the flash and she literally completely lost her train of thought for about, for about 20 probably only 10 seconds, but her brain is different. And it's made her very, very interested in the um, human brain and how it works. So she had these young people in inner city London and she noticed that there were all, all sorts of incredible problems. She described one girl who would sort of, whenever she was around, bash her head against concrete repeatedly. And she had to put her hand under her head to stop her. You know, about, I think she said about um, a third of them had either um, been stabbed or seen someone stabbed. It was, it was those sorts of extreme experiences. But she said what she found was as these people opened up to her, that they all started saying the same thing. They started saying to her, but Camilla, we can't help it. I don't want to do these things. I don't want to be violent, but I can't help it. And the stories around that were so similar that she started to think, well, what if they actually can't help it? What's, what, what might be going on? So she looked up some um, famous brain people around the world, and she persuaded them to um, meet with her to start kind of actually genuinely look into this because of her own experience with her mind. And she said, well, what, what if something brain-wise is going on? And I mean, when you see a picture of her, she looks very, um, very different. So she said when they first, she first turned up, they thought she was a bit of a loony and <laughs> who are you? But that she persuaded them to listen to her, and they were convinced that she was on something. And she spent up to 20 years um, investing her life in um, trying to really, really, on an intellectual level, um, she can't read everything around because she can't read, but she has them read to her, trying to understand what happens to these children from incredibly disadvantaged backgrounds, what actually happens to their, their brain. Now, I'm going to show you a, a clip. Um, she talks for about four minutes, but she explains it better than me, and I genuinely think you will find it interesting. So um, hopefully it will be the right... Bit. She's a fascinating character. When you, she, she dresses so vibrantly. You'll see. Is that all right? Is that all right, Robert? When a child is growing up in a situation where they're constantly frightened, they release vast amounts of adrenaline and noradrenaline without getting any kind of break from this fright condition. The adrenaline enters the emotional centers of the brain, the limbic system deep inside the brain, and starts dysregulating the electrical and chemical activity in there. We've now got scanning ability that shows us that children who've been chronically maltreated have deficits in structure and functioning of key areas of their brains. And what the studies are showing is that our genes determine the boundaries of our development. My genes dictate that I won't grow wings and fly, but within that boundary, how we end up developing is entirely dependent on the conditions of care that we've been exposed to. So if you have in your gene the capacity for aggression and the capacity for kindness, if your environment is constantly demanding of you to negotiate circumstances of violence and violation, then that aspect of your gene that is responsible for negotiating aggression will get upregulated in the service of survival. And then epigeneticists believe that this alteration in expression becomes baseline genetic programming for the next generation. 
It is in this context that I believe we're sitting on a potentially lethal time bomb as the repercussions of violence begin not to impact just the children that are surviving them now, but potentially future generations, both in terms of the alterations in biological expression, but also in the impaired capacity of the parent to take care of their offspring in the future. What do we know? We know that we are operating in terms of our care structures based on a flawed premise. We believe that the fundamental construct is one in which if you morally educate a child, correct them through sanctions and reward them, that they will end up behaving appropriately. That structure is appropriate for someone who has an organized a cognitive capacity, can memorize sanctions, has enough control to exercise a full stop when they're about to do something wrong, and then use the memory of the sanction to prohibit themselves from doing the next wrong thing. But actually, children who've been chronically violated and have had very poor attachments have a double whammy damage that prevents them from making use of this moral construct appropriately. Firstly, your capacity to be pro-social is given to you because of the kind of attachment to relationships that you've been exposed to. Literally, that loving care that we've been given builds up the fabric of the brain in the frontal lobe. And it's our frontal lobe that we need in order to maintain our capacity for planning, our capacity to be empathetic, to consider somebody else's point of view and to exercise personal control and regulate emotion and energy. So when the emotional centers of your brain are firing away and saying, what is this mad woman saying? Why doesn't she get off the stage? Your frontal lobe comes along and says, oh, she's doing a TED talk. She'll go in a minute. <laughs> and in that way, you regulate yourself. OK, now it, it, she was. She spoke for about um, 50 minutes, and she was so interesting to listen to. Now, I know right now it's you probably thinking, this doesn't feel like a church. Where's your Bible? But listen, I think this is really important because there's so many tangents to follow here. And Christ, Jesus Christ, and science, I do not believe are mutually exclusive. I don't. Because I think it's very interesting to understand both. And I think we have to be incredibly um, discerning. We have been learning for weeks that to read the Bible, you cannot just lift it up and take everything off the page at face value. You have to be discerning in when it was written, how it was written, the context around it. You have to come to it with a wisdom and a discernment and an open heart. And so coming all the things that come into our view with the same measure, I think is incredibly helpful. It also stops us appearing really sort of ignorant. If you're ever in conversations with people out of faith and they start to say this, 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 and this with science, you can't just say science doesn't mean anything. It's, it's fascinating. And I think all these things help us understand um, how sometimes... I've taught now for 17 years. Um, and the way young people are is just not the same with the introduction of different media culture with the pace at which these things go it's changing the, the attention spans and the way people think and we as a body of people have to also be be thinking right how do people think who we're now currently dealing with and how will that affect the way we maybe communicate differently that was my tangent i shall bring it back in essence this lady's study um, showed that i mean this is one thing she said more on monday where there has been excessive fright, she called it, where children have been very, very afraid, and a lack of nurture and love, our brains struggle to regulate energy and emotion, and they look to find solutions and soothing in ways that we've become programmed to remember. Right, hang with me, because this is interesting, right? Children who have been raised, she talked about like a mother voice, although it doesn't have to be a mother, it could have been a father or some kind of other carer. She talked about how children have been raised with a mother voice. They learn how to internalize that voice and they get their own inside little mother voice. So even when mother's not there, or the equivalent, they can tell themselves what they heard. Um, if you've never had that, you, can't, you don't ever develop the inside voice that tells you 
what to think or not think in those moments. So you don't think those things because nobody told you you need to, to think them. Um, so the area that actually, when they did scans, on the scans, you know, these CT scans, they physically looked different. The areas of the brain looked physically different. Um, now, the science of this is that then becomes part of your genetic coding. So then you'd pass on that pattern to your children and your children's children, which again, I think is quite fascinating because you can kind of see that. Um, unless something is introduced to restore Yay. it back to its, introduce that mother voice back in somewhere. Now, for example, let me make this practical. A child who grows up afraid of being hit physically. They recognize when a parent or carer or whoever is becoming angry and that tension and fear, knowing that's coming, is utterly overwhelming. They know it's coming and the tension and the fear is just awful. Now, when the violent act actually happens, because there is a beginning, middle and an end, there's actually been a physical whatever, actually when the violence has happened, the child feels better because the fear and the tension is now over, so the event actually becomes a comfort because it means that they're not worrying about it coming anymore. Does that make sense? Yes? So what she was saying then is that the cells, I loved this line, the cells of the body code the harm, not the narrative. Yes. So you remember, you don't remember that full story. What you remember is, the violence made me feel better. So. For children, I'm putting this very simplistically, for, but for a child who that violence made them feel better, guess what they go and do to feel better? They're, bit, they're violent, yes? So because they don't remember the story about that being negative, they remember the feeling of, oh, when violence happened, I felt better, the tension was over, the fear was over, I felt better, I felt relieved. So she was saying that we don't remember the pieces of the story, our brain just remembers, I was afraid then, and then I did that, and then I felt better. Now, this isn't for me, just about, um, I'm skipping ahead. This for me is not just about children with traumatic childhoods. This isn't, this isn't what this is about. Because I believe we have all, well, we ne I know we've all experienced fear. And depending on the different levels of fear and how old we were, we've all come up with solutions to our fears. We've all come up with those because we've all had them and we've all found ways of coping with them. And it doesn't matter whether they're, the science of this is, is, is technically right, we've all become wired to handle our fears in certain ways. Now, incidentally, she did say on Monday, I thought this was also fascinating, that neglect in children has the same impact on the brain as abuse, on the scans. So, you know, some of, some of you in here, don't be sitting there thinking, yeah, well, I, I, I was, you know, I had quite an asshole or whatever. Some of you were neglected when you were young, and that may well have um, damaged how you think and how you're wired. Um, these are some of the ways I think we regulate ourselves. All of us have been afraid, and we've all found ways to regulate ourselves and find comfort. Maybe, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are the things that I thought of today. Maybe we hide when we're afraid we hide. See if any of these are you. Maybe we run away. Maybe we talk. Maybe we eat, maybe we don't eat. Maybe we harm ourselves. Maybe we obsess over stuff. Maybe we avoid. Maybe we people please. Maybe we get angry. There's all ways that we, we find to, to, to comfort ourselves and soothe ourselves when we're afraid. Um, now, the only difference is some of our solutions are easier to judge than others. Some of them are more exposed. Some of them are less socially acceptable. But we all have them. We all have them. Now, in the spirit of openness, I'm going to share mine, okay? I don't want to, but I will. I'm a little afraid. <laughs> my solution, see, my solution is talking. So actually, this will probably make me feel better. <laughs> don't know whether that's all right or not. Oh, well. Okay, now, as a child, I was quite shy and I was quite anxious. I remember that. I remember that from a tiny, teeny tiny, teeny tiny person. And I was afraid for very good reason, because some of the things were a bit scary. I remember some things happened when I was younger that were a bit frightening. Um, and I was afraid for other reasons that really um, held no real weight, but that was just the kind of child that I, that I, that I was. I don't remember how, remember how I became that, but I did. Now, when I was 12, um, 
I connected with this message I heard about God in a church. I've been raised in the church, and I remember the meeting. I remember the guy. I remember what he said. And I remember, th- I remember thinking, that's going to make me feel better. Do you remember that song? My chains fell off. My heart was free. My rose went forth and followed thee. I remember hearing that line, having a very genuine experience, my heart thudding in my chest, thinking, I know I am not free, and you're telling me if I pursue this, I'm going to be free. I like the sound of that. And I remember making a decision that, do you know what, whatever this thing was, I was going to um, pursue it. Now, I pursued this religiously, and I've chosen that word on purpose, and I perfected the lifestyle in many, many ways. Um, I obsessed over it, and it helped me wonderfully. I'm not knocking it all, because it helped me wonderfully um, with this anxiety in my life, because I had this sort of divine port of call, I had this insurance policy, I was going to be okay. Um, It worked wonderfully for me, it really did, and there was enough structures in place within my family, within the church I was in then, and when I moved here, um, when I came to uni, and, and my friendships that I could find incredible satisfaction and joy in it, and it brought me tremendous, tremendous comfort. Um, Then, (laughs) my construct of this God utterly failed me. It utterly failed me because stuff happened and I was not insured. I was not comforted. I was not rescued. I was just in it and it was horrible. Um, And notice how I said my construct of God failed. I didn't say God failed. I said the God I had made in my head. It failed me. It failed me. The whole world went dark. The whole world went empty. And I was just lost. Guess what came back in my life? All that anxiety just literally was then at the surface again because I hadn't found a solution that healed it. We talked about refreshing and healing. I hadn't found a healing. I'd found something that enabled it to be masked in my life. Um, even a God thing that enabled it to be masked in my life. But when, it, when that failed, I was back to being anxious. So what that led me to do is try desperately to rebuild that God construct. <laughs> to rebuild that, well, whatever that was, that God thing made me feel better. So again, I obsessed over it. I, some of you were there while I was obsessing <laughs> over it. Um, just trying to get that back in place in my mind, thinking, well, I must be, uh, I must have fallen, I must uh, not be, uh, be, have enough faith, I must. And I just busted an absolute gut to try and get back to this place of, of, of faith in this thing. And um, it didn't really, um, really happen. And I ended up feeling very weak all over again um, and, and not very, not very great. Um, Now, I recognize in that how difficult that can be to change your mind about some things because I couldn't at that point, and I might have shared some of this before, and I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but I felt I needed to do this. Um, I, I couldn't let go at that point of the God that I had had because I had needed it so much. It had to be true. That version of whatever God was had to be true because I literally did not know how I would cope if that turned out not to be true. And so you have to dig in in those moments. You have to think, well, I must be wrong, this must be wrong, whatever. And you just keep pushing, pushing harder. Now, this, this will probably make you, make you laugh, and it's not supposed to, but you can laugh. But as a child, um, because I was anxious, the other thing I did was um, I organized my things. My books were in alphabetical color and height order. You may laugh. And um, my curtains, I couldn't have any gaps between, my mum had to stretch my curtains. And I developed all these weird little, weird little obsessive things because it, again, helped with my anxiety. I couldn't order what was in here, I couldn't control what was out here, but I could control my things. Guess what else returned to my life, big style? When, um, you know, all these things happened, I started, I joke about my OCD, I do joke about it, Um, but Actually, it can be a genuinely real problem. When I am stressed up to the eyeballs, I obsess over being organized, the house being tidy, everything being sorted, my emails. I cannot have more than 10 emails in my inbox. If I have more than 10 emails in my inbox and I've not filed them, I genuinely get stressed, genuinely get stressed, because one of my solutions to handling my anxiety is that my stuff is ordered. Now, um, 
I'm saying this as a practical example of how I cope with my fear, but you have your own. I can say it and not feel inferior to any of you, because I know you've got yours. You may not know what they are, but you've got yours. You have got your things you go to for comfort that, that help you with the stuff in your life that you find difficult. If you um, don't have those, then I'm really happy for you that nothing's ever happened in your life to take you beyond your own resources. Yeah. Quite, quite envy you. Um, um, and I hope it doesn't, because it's horrible. <laughs> now, why I've put this here, if we all have these constructs that bring relief to us, um, and they keep bringing relief to us, why are they a problem? Because you might think, well, well so what? You want to organize your emails, and you want to you organize your emails, you want to keep your house tidy, I want to do this, if I'm stressed, I want to do this. Why are those things a problem if they work for us? And I think it's interesting what... Chris opened with really because how can I be either hot or cold when I'm organizing my stationery for goodness sake H how how if I'm if I'm I know I, that does sound funny um, if, but if I when I am in that mode of being too busy and my husband is not here tonight I'm quite glad because he's not when I am in that mode of being too busy and I am overwhelmed and anxious I am utterly preoccupied you cannot get through to me I have to I have, I have to have everything sorted um, and I'm utterly preoccupied and that isn't me being hot or cold that is me not being fully a representation of Christ on earth now you might think well so what I think that's our responsibility I do think that's our responsibility I think if my life is about and um, I will live for myself I will cope with the things how I want to cope with things I will do the things that are comfortable for me I will suit I, I will just do the things that suit me I can live however I want but if I've said no I'm following Christ I no longer get to live however I want I don't get to keep my solutions if that is my choice. Now, there was a guy one day came to Jesus, and he, he's often referred to as the rich young ruler. And um, he comes to Jesus, says, what must I do to enter the, enter the kingdom? And he's all, his thinking's all wonky. So again, Jesus sets about changing his mind. And the challenge that comes to this man is, do you know what? Go on then, if you really want to be in this, sell everything you've got and give to the poor. You reckon you're loving your neighbor as yourself. Okay, go love your neighbor with all the wealth you've got and then come and follow me. Now, the man actually says, goes away sad, walks away from Jesus sad, because he knows he can't do that. But at least he acknowledges he can't do that and doesn't pretend he can. He looks at the option. He looks at the option. He says, Jesus, you want me to follow this here, and that's going to cost me that. I'm not prepared to pay that because actually this money, what I have, what I've acquired is of such comfort to me. I would rather have that than follow you. But at least he makes a choice. And there comes a point where you think, right, I can live my life with my own solutions, with what I have acquired, and there's some of that stuff I want to keep. And I can keep it if I want to, or I can say, no, if I choose to live and say I'm going to follow Jesus, following Jesus is not saying I'm following Jesus. Following Jesus is following Jesus. So it, it isn't the words, is it? I think we're back to this hot and cold thing. We're either going to do it or we're not going to do it. But let's at least, I, I requested that song tonight where it says, I will face the things in me that I don't want to see. If you have got things in your life today that you are not going to let go of, at least own that and say, right now, Jesus, I know right now you would want this for my life. And I'll be honest with you, Jesus, I don't feel right now I can do it. I want to be able to do it, but I can't do it. So I'm just going to come and I'm going to say to you, honestly, Jesus, I don't know if I can. Start there. Now, I don't want you to stop there because he walked away. And I don't think that's a good plan. But at least you've been honest with yourself. And then I would advise you to be honest with someone else and to change your mind because I think... I'd advise you to change your mind, because otherwise, if you do nothing, what do we get? Luke Wall. Right. So I guess I'm asking you, what solutions are you using? And have you always used? And um, are you tired of them yet? Because <laughs> they don't work very well, do, do they? And I've put here, um, maybe we've got to dig deeper, have the difficult conversations, get honest with ourselves, be humble. Um, 
And I had to accept that I was not who I'd believed myself to be or worked really hard to be. I wasn't it. I wasn't this super great woman of faith. I was a woman with just enough to believe that maybe, just maybe, he could do, still do something with me. And wonderfully he could, which is lovely. Um, and wonderfully he could, not because I'm up here, but because in here I'm coming to peace again, which is wonderful. Um, still tired of my stage running up too much, but I'm working on it. Now, I have been, very, I have been tempted many, many times um, to try to rebuild this um, God I had. But it occurred to me today that if we try and keep that construct of, of whatever God we'd ha- we've had when there's time to change our mind, with the equivalent to, you know, the children of Israel, Moses goes up the mountain to get revelation from God. He's gone too long. If they don't like it, you're not being clear here, Moses. We don't know what's going on. We don't know where we're going. We don't have everything pinned down. It's all a bit wishy-washy, Moses. So what do they do? They melt all their own stuff into a pot, make a calf in their own image, and then they act like that is God and dance around. They all know they melted their stuff. Why did they pretend they didn't know that? They knew they were there. They were there when they threw in their jewelry, melted it in the pot. They saw the calf being made, and then within minutes, they have convinced themselves that that's a God, but they knew they made it. And we can do that all the time. And you can melt your own God into your own pot if you want, but it's not real. It's not real. Um, there's an expression along the lines of you're not all that meaning you're not everything you think you are and I think a lot of the time we're not all that (laughs) we're not everything that we think we are and I'm not saying that negatively because I think sometimes um, we've got in our heads that we're sort of some things that we're not but we've also not got in our heads how wonderfully restored we are Because whatever fears there has been and whatever damage there has been to our life, there is a God who heals. Now, Camilla's solution, after 20 years of research, guess what the core ingredients are that heal this? It's love, cherish. Love and cherish. Because she said, what you've got to do is love and cherish. And that reminded me of being married. That's in the wedding vows, isn't it? And what are we? We are the bride. We are the bride. The church is supposed to be the bride. So aren't we the epitome of love, cherish? Isn't that at our, our call that we're loved and cherished, that we're called to love and cherish, that everything about us is love and cherished? And the other thing I thought today was, there is, did you see that song? Is that thing where we talked about cast your cares on Jesus. We talked about casting stones, didn't we, and throwing stones. Casting your cares, almost saying, right, I'm afraid of you. I don't know what to do with it, so I can either go with my own solution or I can say, right, here's my fear. I'm going to cast it that direction rather than the direction I've always cast it in. And it might be difficult, and I might have to push through some stuff, and I might have to face some stuff about myself that I don't want to see, but I might actually get a decent solution, a healing, a wholeness that I've not had. Um, Right. Last thing. This is where I struggled. <laughs> I rewrote all this today at 4 o'clock. And I didn't really get to a conclusion. I'm going to get you where I've got, and then if these guys want to jump off and add anything, they can. So this is my conclusion as a first step. This isn't the whole picture. But as a first step, one thing I thought, what practical one thing do I think helps us start to begin to change our mind from the wiring it has had? Can you just put up that one verse for me, Robert, please? Summing it all up, friends, I'd say you'll do best by filling your minds and meditating on things true, noble, reputable, authentic, that's honesty, isn't it, compelling, gracious, the best, not the worst, the beautiful, not the ugly, things to praise, not things to curse, put into practice what you learned from me, what you heard and saw and realized, do that. And God, who makes everything work together, will work, into his, work you into his most excellent harmonies. Beautiful. What if instead of praying all the time that others change their minds, we changed ours? And how do we do that, especially in the areas where we've been ra- wired for years? I, I thought of one practical thing that I know helped me um, climb out of a dark hole. Um, Meister Eckhart, whoever he is, said, if the only prayer you ever say in your entire life is thank you, it will be enough. And um, 
I might have told you this before, but I remember one time in the, the lowest point, standing in my kitchen, and um, I thought, I am going to stand here and I am going to think of 10 things that I am grateful for in my life. And I made myself think of 10 things. And at the time, that was very difficult. And I did that repeatedly because we are so quick to see the negatives in other people, in ourselves. We're always finding the things that we're not happy about. We're always finding the things that are making our life harder. Um, and when, why can't we look for the best? Why can't we, in the situations right now in your life, where you know you're looking for solutions because things are not working for you, where you're, you're most anxious, where you're, you're most stressed, where it's uh, the stuff that you're wrestling over. Why not find something in there to be grateful for? To be grateful for. I'm grateful for all of that lot now because it's brought me to here. I'm grateful for it. All, and if I had to do it all again, I would do it all over again. I am so grateful for it because I now understand that there is a solution, not something that's going to put a plaster on it, but a genuine solution. If it takes me a few more years to hunt down the complete picture, I will do that because I, wa I, want, the real, I want the real deal. And I want us to be the real deal because how can we be um, a solution to the people People in our life when we, we're not yet solved ourselves. Does that make sense? And that's not a criticism, but we have to keep pushing for the real and the authentic in our own life um, because the, the magnitude of that, when we're all hot and cold, as we've already heard, when there's a body of people in here who are either refreshing or healing, guess what? People get refreshed and they get healed. And don't we want people to be refreshed and healed? And don't we want to be the, the hands and feet of the church, his body, that does that job? I do. I do. And that means I've got to own my stuff. And I can't, um, I can't find solutions that are not authentic. Um, because what am I, how am I being an exact representation of the Father when my solutions that I've found are flawed? I want genuine solutions. Um, so that's where I have got to so far. Um, I want the genuine and I want the real and I want this to be a place where everyone feels loved and cherished. But when I say that, don't think, don't think when I say that, that I'm talking about how everybody loves and cherishes you. You love and cherish. Because if you love and cherish... If all the yous love and cherish, everyone will get love and cherish. If we sit here waiting to be loved and cherished, if we all sit here waiting to be loved and cherished, nobody gets loved and cherished. So the only way this can work is if, if out of gratitude and seeking to find the best, we, we start here, change here, start here. Right. Do you want to... Um, I'll let one of you, if you want to add, you don't have to. It doesn't want to sit down. very much a case of, well, you know, I haven't got a thought. I've just got a few basic things. And then they get up here, and it always just seems to beautifully come together. And I think that we were talking a couple of weeks ago about um, do we still, you know, believe that the Spirit has the same power? You know, as we've walked this journey over the last however many years, you know, we've questioned and, and held up to scrutiny a lot of our old mindsets. And we're really trying to look into kind of all, you know, what still stands and what still has value. And without a shadow of a doubt, more than ever before, I absolutely know that, that the Father's Spirit is absolutely intertwined in every single thing that goes on because it seems, even tonight, the Spirit was absolutely bleeding out of what Jenny was saying and it was, it was right, it was for this time. Um, I was only saying to Jenny a few weeks ago that you know, in all of the stuff that we're learning about New Covenant and about the truth about who the Father really is and, and Christ and all of that, sometimes... Um, we can, we can miss talking about some of the very, the very practical elements, like how does the brain become what it becomes because of conditioning things. And I know over time we've looked at them, but for Jenny to bring it back tonight um, has really given us as an insight and in actually how damaged some of us, I would say all of us, can become because of our, of our childhoods. Now, on saying that, really you did wrap it up anyway. It was a, it was a perfect 
you know, end. Um, but what, what did I think? What did I get from it? When you talked about how don't come looking for where is the love for me, start being grateful and giving the love, the love out. One of the greatest issues in our world is, is pride, right? One, I, one of the issues that I believe to be the greatest. Now, when I say pride, what do I mean? I mean people who are overindulgent in the context of I am amazing and people who are underindulgent, who are self-loathing, bring the biggest crisis to this earth, right? Now, some of you will think, oh, well, you know, but it's really sad those who think, oh, you know, I'm just so down in the dumps. You know, they're the people who need a helping hand. And then often we judge then the people who are like full of themselves in a big-headed way because, oh, well, they've got it all together and, you know, they've got the money, they've got the cars and da 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 Actually, both of them are as destructive as, the other, as each one, right? And why? Because actually it all comes down to me, 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 doesn't it? Me, my, mine, I am the central entity of this world and everything will revolve around how I feel. And excuse me for saying it because I do it too. When we're getting a monk, who's the person that exists on this earth? It's me and no one else around to some degree is even there. Now, is that a problem? No, because all of us struggle, so I get it. But if only, like Jenny was saying, we would get to the point in those moments where we thought, I'm going to change my mind here and look on how I can give out and bring some love to the world. Now, when Jesus was talking about the kingdom, he wasn't talking about going to heaven. And I know most of you understand that, but if you're new with us tonight, you know, all of this stuff when he's talking about the kingdom, of, you know, the kingdom of heaven, he wasn't talking about a place you go to. He was saying, I'm trying to establish something here and now. I believe the peaceable kingdom exists when we get out of our own backsides and start giving and contributing and loving and partaking and being kind and being gracious and being honoring. And excuse the terminology, but I think all of us need to get to that point. I think this place will soar the more we start letting ourselves go and start seeing that other people matter. Does that make sense? And I don't want to sound harsh. I mean, this is excitement. This is not me being angry, I promise. It's, and I just, I feel like tonight, I want to declare over my life and over the people of The Rock's life that we, as a house, are going to stay together, hear me, we're not going to walk away, right? Because we're going to be willing to provide a service for this community that says that you are loved, you are accepted, you are forgiven. Why? Because each and every one of us in this building have had that same experience. For those who have been loved much, forgiven much, I apologize, love much. Now here's the thing. If you are not loving, you have yet to recognize the forgiveness that has been bestowed upon your life. That's the challenge of this house. If you stand in judgment, accusation, condemnation of another, you yourself have not yet realized what you have been forgiven of. And I'm telling you, this house, we're too lukewarm at the minute in the way that we're manifesting our characters. And yet the culture isn't, but we've become dull. And why? And it's actually because we have yet to go back to that place where we realize the absolute relentless love and forgiveness that Christ expressed. It's absolutely phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And what was he expressing? He wasn't expressing that this angry God all of a sudden because Jesus comes to earth is now happy with you. He was saying, do you not get it from the very start of creation? The value that is upon your life is beyond anything you can imagine. So it's time, guys. It's time to allow that value it's time to get these neuroreceptors in the brain fixed. You know what neuroreceptors are? They're the, thing, the signals that basically allow you to be who you are, function who you are. Those neuroreceptors can be changed, you know. They can be changed. They can be educated to be reprogrammed. So what I want tonight, and I hope you hear my heart, and this is all from what you've said, Jenny, I think it's just so awesome. I want there to be a reprogramming of our brains in this place a reprogramming, and that comes down to a willingness and a heart to say, this is not just about me. This is about the, the, whole, the whole thing, about people, about society, about 
about this kingdom that we're trying to birth because I'm telling you, I honor and admire this house like you would not believe because I know what we have understood is potentially, is potentially worldwide. It's massive. World class. I would say it's world class as well. Now, when I say worldwide, I'm not saying that to, to blow our trumpet in the sense of, you know, well, look at us. I'm doing it because actually, when Jesus came, that wasn't the end. And we read scripture looking back to Jesus as if that is where the ball stopped. Well, I'm telling you, you need to be a Jesus now. We need to be a Jesus now in our world because if we're not, the story dies and it was never meant to die. Jesus came to start an, uh, a revolution that said from now until the end of wherever the end of time is, you now take the story. You pick up the, you pick up the baton and you run with it. And, and I hope tonight you've got the baton because it's absolutely awesome. I'm gonna finish there because I think it's absolutely incredible. I want you to be inspired, you to be inspired tonight. And if, if you're new to us tonight, Get on board because we would love to have you as part of this journey. You, I hope you felt loved and we would also like to feel some love from you as well. And we would love to you to get onto this boat as we continue to revolutionize our city and beyond. Good night and God bless. I think you're absolutely incredible and we'll leave it there. The kids can't be picked up for another eight minutes. So parents, you have time to chill still. So have you enjoyed tonight? Good, I hope you have. Let, okay, yeah, let's pray, let's pray. It's, it's something that, again, the word prayer is an interesting one, isn't it? We can freely talk and then sometimes when we pray, we think, oh, everything's gotta go all. What is prayer? What is prayer to me? I believe prayer is about coming into alignment and into oneness with the authentic and the heart of God. Now, when I say God, I, we, we sometimes picture him as this one singular being, a man. Let's even get out of that. Let's just see it as being this huge source of energy and power and, and, and um, kindness and love and, and a loving embrace, all of those amazing things you can imagine, that's what I want you to picture. What I wanna declare over this house tonight, Lord Father, your very essence and your very nature is one of love. And I declare tonight that although you are not in control in the context of that you can't just click your fingers and just make everything okay because at the end of the day, Lord, you know that we are people with our own brains. We're not robots. We have choice and you never intended that we become like rigid robots. You wanted us to be able to choose and be real. And therefore tonight, Lord, I come to you and ask that you will somehow reveal yourself in whatever ways you can, whether it be in the meeting of someone at a coffee shop, whether it be in someone driving down the street and respecting nature, whatever it may be, that your energy and your power will be revealed in every single person's life and that they will connect and they will get on this incredible journey and this train here as a family at the Rock of York because I want to see that we can grow and we can change and we can learn and we can develop, Lord, so we can be at the forefront of seeing this peaceable kingdom being established in this world. Because, Lord, while ever I am breathing on this planet in spite of all of my shortfalls and all of my Mr. Bean as Lord Father, one thing I'm not gonna do is stop allowing what I've experienced with radical forgiveness and radical grace to be dis. Be dis be bestowed upon the other, other lives in this earth, Lord Father. So Lord, I pray as we leave tonight that each and every one of us will, will be reminded, will have a subtle reminder of the areas in our life, Lord, where you have absolutely bestowed kindness and love and forgiveness and grace upon us. And we will therefore, out of that understanding of forgiveness, we will bestow love upon those around us. I ask it, Lord, tonight that you will be there, you will understand us, you will talk to us, you will reveal yourself to us, and we will go forth and prosper in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yeah, we'll leave it there. All right, guys. You can pick the kids up in five minutes. All right. Love you lots. Good